to what end should you devote your life? And another question might be, well, does it matter? Matter is an interesting word, eh? Because matter is matter. But matter is also what matters. And I would say that what matters is more real than matter. At least that's how you act. And then the question is, well, is there something you should be aiming at? It's a good question. That's the question of the meaning of life. And you know, one of the things that's supposed to happen when you come to university is that that's the sort of question that should be addressed. And as far as I can tell, and this might just be my more cynical side, what I see happening to university students, generally speaking, is that they come in clinging to the wreckage of their culture and floating with the pieces, and those pieces are taken away by professors who tell them that everything can be dis deconstructed and no nothing has any real meaning and it's like when you're finally educated it's when you're floating out on the ocean and you've got nothing to stay afloat with it's like well then you're you're done and you can graduate and it's like i don't see that as useful quite the contrary People ask what the meaning of life is, and it seems to me that meaning is proportionate to the adoption of responsibility. You know, like, let's say you have a little sister who's like three, and you're going to take care of her. Like, questioning whether that's a good idea just seems stupid. You know what I mean? It just doesn't seem like the right kind of question. It's like, well... Obviously, self-evidently, let's say, that's what you do. And do you find it meaningful? It's like probably, you know, interacting with a little kid. When, when, we, when I had little kids, you know, when they were like two or under, we took them out to see their relatives and they were older people. And, you know, they watched that two-year-old like, like it was a fire. You know, every second that that little kid was in the room, Every single adult was focused on, focused on, on him or her. That, that's something that people attend to. And that's a source of meaning. And what else is meaningful? Well, your family relationships are meaningful to you. And maybe the responsibility that you adopt as, as a friend, that, that seems meaningful. Maybe your decision to pursue a particular career and be of some utility in society. You know, part of that's governed by your desire to establish some security and get ahead, it's fine, but you're also playing an integral role in the maintenance of the structure that supports you. And my observation has been that in my clinical practice is that people just have a hell of a time if they don't have if they don't slot in somewhere, you know. You know, you think I gotta go to work at nine in the morning and you know I've got this rigid schedule, it's like it's probably a good idea to be grateful for that because what I've noticed is that if people pull out from those externally scaffolded systems, they drift, they get depressed, they get anxious, they don't know what to do with themselves. You know, they're kind of like sled dogs with no sled. And we're kind of like sled dogs as far as I can tell, beasts of burden. Like we need a load, man. We need a load. And the question is, what, what sort of load do you need? And here's why I think we need, we need that. You know, there's, I've been thinking about how to figure out what's real for a long time. And because I'm an existentialist, I'm operating under the presupposition that you can tell what people believe by watching what they, how they act. I don't care what they say. I don't care what their statements are about their view of reality. Because the correlation, the relationship between that and their actual actions is not, certainly not perfect and sometimes doesn't even exist. One thing I've noticed is that people, no one argues with their own pain. Everyone who hurts acts as if they believe that pain is real. So we could say, 
The ultimate reality is pain. That's how people act. It's in keeping with the claims of many religious traditions. You know, the Jews are always recollecting past pain. I mean, the Christian God is a crucified person. I mean, there's a fair bit of pain there. For the Buddhists, the fundamental maxim is that life is suffering. And it seems to me that there's a metaphysical claim there. The metaphysical claim is that pain is real. Now, of course, it depends on what you mean by real. But people act as if their pain is real. Now, that poses a problem. Life is a pain. Life is suffering, let's say. And why is that? Well, it's because you can be broken, hurt, and destroyed. And so, that seems pretty self-evident. And worse, you know it. And that makes people unique. Like, that's our self-consciousness, right? That's really what separates us, in some sense, from other creatures. I mean, other creatures have some self-consciousness, like a chimp can learn to recognize itself in a mirror, and so can a dolphin, but, you know, that's pretty... <laughs> That's pretty bare-bones self-consciousness, you know? Real self-consciousness is the knowledge of your borders. And not only in space, but in time. And as far as I can tell, human beings are the only creatures that have discovered the future. And that's really good because we can plan for the future, but it's really bad because, you know, the future's finite, and that's, like, that's a big shock to the old system. And it's the existential burden that everyone bears, and it's associated integrally with suffering. And so then you think, well, life is suffering, and, and it's finite, and that's part of the suffering. That's part of what you makes you question the value of existing, and maybe the value of existence itself. So then what do you have to wor use as a weapon against that? Well, you know, we talked a little bit about responsibility. That seems to work, you know. The, the amount of responsibility that you adopt with, in relationship to things seems to increase your meaningful engagement. And you might say, well, what's the most meaningfully engaged activity? And you might say, well, how about a little reduction in the old suffering? You know, so you live your life so that you're not causing undue pain especially pointless pain, that would be good, and maybe you could even be more useful than that, and you could figure out some ways that some suffering, yours, other people's, both, if you're really, you know, hitting a home run, maybe you can figure out some way that some of that could be rectified, and that seems to be meaningful in and of itself. I mean, if it's pain that makes you doubt the meaning of life, which is perfectly reasonable, then this cessation of pain, the cessation of suffering, the minimization of suffering, as a logical corollary, should be the proper medication. And so I would say that means that there's some mode that you can conduct yourself in that makes you a good person. And part of being a good person is to alleviate suffering. The first thing I'm going to propose to you, and we'll talk about this a lot, is that you inhabit a story. That the framework through which you look at the world is actually a story. And here's the story. The story is, you're somewhere, and you're going somewhere. And you know, that can be conceptual or whatever. It's that, but there's a gradient between where you are and what, where you're aiming at, which means no more, really, than you're doing something while you're sitting there. And hypothetically, you're aiming for something better. And so, you're in a state of insufficiency, always. The insufficiencies change, and then you're trying to rectify the insufficiency, and you presume that your current state is less preferable to the state that you're aiming at. And then, the way that you bring those two together is, sometimes you can do it through thinking, but fundamentally you do it through action. You do it through acting in the world, and so that's sort of that's sort of the answer, in some sense, to the mind-body problem. You have a conceptual structure, but when you implement it, you're, you're implementing it 
not abstractly, you're implementing it through action. And so that's, that's the basic story. It's not a very interesting story, but it's the framework through which you view the world. You got to aim at something. It's like, otherwise your life is meaningless. Well, what should you aim at? Well, I don't know. Well, pick something, pick something. Aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay. But at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. And I think that's something that's open for everyone. You can do that. I shouldn't say that because I don't believe that. I think you can find yourself in a situation that's so dire that you don't, there's no escape from it. But that doesn't matter because this still, this is, the hero myth might not be, the best we have might not always work, but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. It's still the best we have. I mean, everyone dies and so we fail in some sense. The fact that a symphony ends doesn't mean that it wasn't worth listening to. What does the most useful person look like? Well, who is everyone hoping they'll meet? And that's a genuine question. Like, and that's the ideal. The ideal is the person everyone's hoping they'll meet. That's Christ in, in the Christian culture, psychologically speaking, independent of any religious claims. So that's, these, 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 th this is, this is, I suppose, the essential idea of the archetype from the Jungian perspective. We have the, we have the image of an ideal. And because it is the ultimate ideal, it has a religious element. It's compelling. It's a judge. Why is it a judge? Well, if you fall short of the ideal, your conscience punishes you. So it's a judge. And it's merciful. Well, why? Because if you act out the ideal, then your life improves. You know, and I said, well, the question, what is the relationship between these images of the psyche and reality? I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know where the archetype shades into reality. <laughs> it depends to some degree on how you define reality. And, you know, this is, I, I've been People don't like that statement. But when, when you're asking questions that are deep enough, you start to have to ask, what do you mean by true, for example? What do you mean by real? Because the questions you ask get so deep that they're of the same kind as the question, what is real or what is true? You know, if think of it this way, reality is what we adapt to by definition. That's reasonable. If you're a Darwinian, you have to say that's actually as far as you can go. Reality is that which shapes us. You can't get a better handle on reality than that. Well, when you make a picture of objective reality, it's not the same as that. It's a different picture. And it's not obvious which one should play Trump. Now, the hero myth, as far as I can tell, is an evolutionary artifact. And that means that for human beings, that the hero image is the path of, of optimal adaptation. Does that reflect reality? Well, it does insofar as reality has selected that. Well, does that mean that reality is a story? Because the hero myth is a story, or at least that's one of the things it is. Does it mean that reality has a narrative aspect? Well, it does insofar as we act things out. Does that mean that reality is ultimately a story? Well, I don't know. But the answer isn't obviously no. Yeah, I mean, in that chapter, that's do not allow yourself to become arrogant, deceitful, or resentful. I might have the order wrong there, but that's the chapter. Yeah, it opens with a discussion of why you would get resentful. It's like, well, Culture is arrayed against you, so you're the target of tyrannical forces that are beyond your control. They're arbitrary. They don't work in your interest, at least not entirely. 
And the more eccentric you are, let's say, the more tyrannical culture will be to you. And so you're stuck with that. And then nature conspires to destroy you constantly and is going to do that with pain and anxiety and aging. And then there's the uncontrollability and darkness of your own psyche. And everyone faces those. Now, we face the positive elements of those too, the beneficence of culture, the beauty of nature, the glory of the human spirit. That's there as well. You have reasons to be deceitful, resentful, and arrogant. But it's not a good game unless you want to produce hell. We have to strive not to be wretched. There's something that doesn't seem fair about that. Why couldn't we just be happy being who and what we are? Why is it that we're punished if we don't strive? Well, I don't know. I'm, we're negentropic organisms, right? I mean, we have to maintain this incredible complexity in the face of a dissipating universe. It requires effort. It's the, it's the, it's the second law of thermodynamics, I believe. That's why we have to strive. Well, why is the world constituted that way? Couldn't, I guess it's an infantile paradisal wish in some regard. Couldn't we just be rewarded for who we are? I can understand that. But I don't think that it works. I don't think that's how things work. I don't think things function like that. And I don't think probably in the final analysis we really want them to. I don't know if anyone enjoys undeserved reward. You know, it, it feels kind of creepy. Doesn't it to be rewarded for something you didn't do? It does. I'm obsessed with this idea of the physics of being human, that there are just certain things that are true, that our brain has algorithms running in them that are going to push us to be um, striving to, you know, push against entropy, you know, partly just to, you have to risk danger to go out and get food and provide for your family and keep them safe. So it makes sense that you have that pushing at your back. Um, also seems to me that you have an innate drive for progress and that you'll never be happy if you're not advancing in some way, getting better Well, I think that's technically true, you know, and in Maps of Meaning in particular, I make a neuropsychological argument for that based on, mostly based on the work of Jeffrey Gray, who I think was the greatest neuropsychologist of the last half of the 20th century. And he drew a lot of his ideas from Norbert Weiner, who was a, a cyber, cybernetic theorist who was um, instrumental in the development of artificial intelligence. These ideas have a uh, what would you call it, a stellar academic um, uh, uh, origin and positive emotion. Gray laid this out better than anyone else. The positive emotion that we find sustaining is experienced in relationship to an unachieved goal. It's hope that drives us forward. We want something, and if we see ourselves moving towards that, then... We're, we're in the grip of the positive emotion that we find sustaining. It isn't the attainment. Attainment is satiating. Attainment shuts down the system that has been striving for that particular object of attainment. If you're hungry and you eat, you stop being hungry. Now, that's good because the hunger is gone, but that whole frame disappears. You can no longer strive within that frame, and you need a new frame to strive towards. And so technically... and. This is well established as far as I'm concerned. We even know the drugs that people abuse, cocaine, let's say, amphetamines, the ones that are potent sources of positive emotion, activate the system that regulates our emotional response to evidence that we're moving towards a desired goal. So cocaine, for example, is an exhilarating drug. It makes you feel that things are worthwhile because it hijacks the system that does make indicate that things are worthwhile. So. This is deeply, this, this striving aspect is deeply rooted in, in, our, in, our, in our biology. One of the things I've noticed time and time again is that whenever I talk about the relationship between responsibility and meaning, the crowds that I'm talking to go silent. Say, look, you need a meaning to sustain you through the vicissitudes of life. Okay, well, try to debate that. It's like, is life painful? Yes. Is it anxiety provoking? Yes. Is it uncertain? Yes. Is it painful beyond bearing sometimes? Yes. It's difficult. 
everyone agrees about that. Now, they might disagree about how difficult, but that doesn't matter. That The central point holds. Okay, what if you think that's all pointless? Well, that doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, so you need a sustaining meaning. Well, where do you find that? Well, you generally find it in responsibility to yourself and to other people. And people ask themselves those questions when, when I'm talking, because I ask them to ask themselves those questions, and that's the answer. Well, what's meaningful? Well, I have a meaningful relationship with my father. I have a meaningful relationship with my wife. I have a meaningful relationship with my pet, you know, because I take care of that pet. Um, when I commit to something and make sacrifices, that sacrifice is something I also talk about a lot in both of the last two books. You know, if something's valuable, you'll make sacrifices to attain it. And that, that discovery of sacrifice, I think that's what separates human. It's one of the primary factors separating human beings from animals. Because we discovered that we could let go of something we value in the present and we would gain something we value even more in the future. We acted that out dramatically in all sorts of strange ways over thousands and thousands of years before it was formalizable psychologically. But it's a massive discovery. I can forego gratification in a particular way and benefit in the future. So I can share the proceeds of my hunt and I store up future food in the form of reputation and the favors I've owed, I'm owed now by other people. It's a massive discovery. The first thing you have to do is orient yourself. Now, you probably have all watched Pinocchio, and Pinocchio is about how a marionette, someone whose, whose strings are being pulled by forces beyond his comprehension, that's the situation of the undeveloped individual. Geppetto, who's a benevolent father, so a benevolent uh, symbol, a symbol of benevolent culture, makes a puppet, his son, and then wishes on a star. Now, a star is something that glitters up in the sky, and it's and it's it's associated with the transcendent and the beyond and the divine. And you know, if you look up in the night sky and it's very dark, you get a feeling of awe. It's because you're confronting your soul, so to speak, your individual soul is confronting the cosmos, and you can feel a relationship between you and 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 the totality so looking up into the sky is a, like a religious experience if, if it's a starry sky and to wish upon a star is to find an, a light that orients you like the north star and to pick a highest goal to pick the highest goal you can conceive of and so that's what Geppetto does he raises his eyes above his his day-to-day -day concerns and tries to establish a relationship with the highest of all possible values and and, and he, he has the most profound of wishes, and the most profound of wishes is that the puppet that he's created could become a genuine individual, a genuinely fully, fully developed human being. And that's what you can wish for yourself. That's You can wish and, 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 and aim for that in yourself. And then, you see, that's how you deal with the suffering that's attendant on life, because life is suffering, and because life is very hard, and people get sick, and they, they become mentally ill, and 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 there's malevolence in the world and there's tragedy and so life is very very hard and if you're not properly oriented with regards to life the fact that it's hard and the fact that it's full of suffering can can warp and twist and bend you until you become murderous and resentful and and even go beyond murderous and resentment to wish for for genocide and evil even to wish for the destruction of everything and so you have to learn how to strengthen yourself as an individual so that you can bear the burden of being without becoming corrupt. You have to decide that that is what you're aiming for, is that you want to become a fully developed human being and stop being a, a, a pathetic marionette whose strings are being pulled by horrible forces behind the scenes. If you're aiming at the good, then you want what's good for you. And I mean good for you as if you were taking care of yourself and, and were good to yourself, who were treating yourself like someone you loved, that it was good for you in a way that would also be good for your family. And then it would be good for you and your family in a way that was also good for society. And then it would be good for you and your family and society in a way that would be good for the world. And then it would be good now. And it would be good next week and the week after and a year from now and as long into the future as you can see. So the good is something that's equilibrated across multiple levels of being in multiple time frames simultaneously and it isn't necessarily that you know what that is going to be at any given moment but you can orient yourself so that's the state that you want to exist in and i can tell you 
as far as I can tell, when you exist in that state, even moment by moment, your life is imbued with a sense of meaning and that sense of meaning can help you transcend suffering. Uh, the philosopher Nietzsche said, he who has a why can bear any how. He who has a why can bear any how. And so Nietzsche's idea was that if there was purpose in your life of sufficient grandeur, that not only could the suffering in life be accepted, but maybe it could even be appreciated. Like it, it could be that you're willing to bear the burden of being because of the exciting things that you can do with being, the things you can build and the things that you can bring about. And that might be the highest imaginable state of being. And that's that's a form of paradise, but it, it's not a paradise that you attain by transforming others. It's a paradise that you attain by transforming yourself. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And it's a very frightening thing to do because it means that you're you're retooling your soul. And that's, that's a job for a real, that's the job for a forthright and honorable person. And it, it's an exciting enough task so that it will keep you occupied for the rest of your life. And then magical things will happen to you while you're, while you're doing it. And the world will arrange itself around you in the most wonderful way, in a musical way, so that every part of what you're experiencing plays off against every other part in a manner that has meaning embedded in every aspect of it. Once you orient yourself, then you have an obligation, I would say, an obligation to the development of your soul to speak the truth. You have to be oriented properly, though, because the truth is, is something that exists in service to an ideal, an ideal of sorts. Then you can imagine that you could use your language two ways. You can use your language to manipulate the world and to extract from it what you want. So, for example, maybe you go out on a date with someone and you decide that the end goal of the date is to have a sexual partner for the night and then you can craft your language to manipulate the person into providing you with you with what you want and that's like an instrumental use of language but the problem with that there's many problems with that but one of them is is that what if your idea about what you should want is wrong like maybe that's not the way to treat someone that you're on a date with out on a date with maybe maybe you're minimizing and reducing the interactions between you from what could be um, a healthy and elevated state of interaction and discourse to something that's that basically the pursuit of impulsive pleasure and not maybe that's not good for you next week and the week after and a month down the road maybe orienting yourself towards impulsive pleasure is a very bad idea remember what happens in pinocchio pinocchio goes to pleasure island and pleasure island is a place where impulsive pleasures can be had at, at a moment's notice but what pinocchio discovers along with jiminy cricket that pleasure island is run by masked to totalitarians they're they're all dressed in black you remember and they're they're turning the children and adolescents who are on pleasure island they're depriving them of their voice turning them into brain jackasses and preparing to sell them as slaves to the salt mines and so there's an implication in that story that the pursuit of impulsive pleasure is one route to totalitarianism and slavery and and i believe that so perhaps orienting your language towards the gathering of impulsive pleasure is a miss is a misuse of, of your highest gift, your the gift of logos, the gift of communication. The alternative is to orient yourself towards the highest good, as we already described, and then speak the truth. Which and you can you can tell when you're doing that because, or you can tell when you're not doing that because if you're if you're not telling the truth, if you're using someone else's words, you're being manipulated in a sense by forces that are behind the scenes. You're not using your own words. You're the puppet of an ideology or another thinker or your own impulsive desires. And you can tell when you're speaking like that because it makes you feel weak. It makes you feel weak and ashamed. And you can localize that feeling physiologically. If you listen to yourself talk, you can tell when, when you're speaking properly, you will experience a feeling of integration and strength. And when you're speaking in a deceitful or manipulative manner, you'll feel that you're starting to come apart at the seams. And what you need to do is practice only saying things that make you feel stronger then you should educate yourself. And it's not that easy to do now because you have to find people who can actually tell you mostly what to read and, and maybe also how to write because writing is a way of, of formulating your thoughts ever more precisely. That's why you go to university to learn how to write. If you, learn, if you know how to write, you can think. If you can think and speak and communicate in writing, you're, you're unbelievably powerful in the authority manner because arguments move the world forward and if your arguments are tight and well constructed and lucid and well edited and carefully thought through and you have five rationales for everything that you're doing 
which is what happens if you learn to write properly, then you're like a force of nature, man. No one can take you down. Anyways, Pinocchio, after he left Pleasure Island, had to go into the ocean twice. And, and the second time he went into the ocean, he was looking for his father. Well, everyone's father, from a mythological perspective, is dying in, in, in the underworld, in the chaos, because everyone inhabits a culture that's that's sick and old, so to speak. And it's sick and old because it was made by the dead. And the living have to revivify it continually in order for it to be a dynamic force. And the living have to revivify their connection with the culture internally too, because you're constructions of culture, although not only constructions of culture. And you have to understand history because otherwise you can't understand yourself. You're a historical creature. And so you have to rescue your dead father from the belly of the beast, from the dragon. Because remember the whale in Pinocchio is also a fire breathing dragon. And that means you have to face the thing that you most fear. And when you do that, you'll rescue your father from the underworld. The future authoring program asks you to write about six different dimensions of your life. Um, so it asks you, first of all, to treat yourself as if you're someone that you want to help and, and that someone that you love and take care of and someone that you want to help. And then it asks you, well, if you could, if you could organize your life in the best possible manner, and in keeping with those principles we discussed earlier, um, what do you want? What do you want for your career? Like, what do you want? What would make your life meaningful? What do you want for your career? What do you want for your family and from your family? What do you want for an intimate relationship? Um, how are you going to handle, how are you going to take care of your mental and physical health? How are you going to handle drug, drug and alcohol use? It asks you a series of fundamental questions like that to get your mind moving. And then it asks you to write for 15 minutes about what your life could be like 50, three to five years in the future if it was laid out like you were laying out a life for someone you deeply cared about. And so you're asked to write for 15 minutes about that without worrying too much about structure, the structure of the argument or, or, or any grammatical niceties. That, that's put off for later. So that gives you a little heaven to aim for, right? It's like, well, if I could have this, my life would be clearly worthwhile, even if I had to put up with a fair bit of suffering along the way. That's what you're trying to construct. And you could think about that as a heaven worth moving towards. And then the second part of the program asks you to write about what your life would be like three to five years down the road if all of your bad habits and nihilistic tendencies and, and proclivity towards resentment and lack of desire to shoulder responsibility, if all your weak points got the upper hand and just augured you into the ground. And everyone knows that. You know what you'd be like if you just let everything slide and, and you'd know what particular hell you were ended up heading towards. And so the, se the second part of the program asks you to write about what your life would be like three to five years down the road if everything just went to hell around you. And so that gives you a hell to avoid and a heaven to strive for. And you need both of those because that's what keeps you properly motivated in life. What tips would you give a highly emotional person to become more rational and level-headed? Oh, well, um, it, it depends. There, there's a variety of... The first thing I would do if you're highly emotional like highly emotional, volatile, fly off the handle, a lot of mood variation, a lot of negative emotion. Um, the first thing you might want to think about is whether or not there's actually something wrong with you, like physically. You might be ill because illness can do that to people. And so you should go get yourself checked out. You know, you might have an inflammatory condition or something like that. that and the next thing I would check out is like, um, are, you sure, are you sure you're not hungry? I'm dead serious about this. I mean, with, with many of my clients who've been anxious, like a lot of them, they come in and say, I'm so anxious, I'm so anxious. I had this one client, she, she'd come in and she'd say, God, you know, I'm just, I'm so dead at the end of the day. I'm, I'm just wiped out. I've got no energy at all. All I can do is lay down. She was like 24. All I can do is lay down and watch like the same movie I watched the night before. Is that normal? It's like, well, no, it's not. So, and I, and I, and I knew this. I said, well, what, what do you eat? And she said, well, I, I usually don't have any breakfast. And then I have like a little bowl of rice for lunch. And I usually have something like that for, for dinner. And I thought, you live on two balls of rice a day. And you're wondering why when you come home at night after a full day's work, you don't have any energy. I said, well, have you considered the possibility that you're starving to death? So, you know, we talked about this. I said, you can't, you can't live like that. that that's not going to work. How about let's try this for a week? 
you do this with therapy and you do experiments if you're a behavioral therapist. It's like, you ought to come to an agreement with the person. It's like, look, is there some other things you need other than rice? You know, like four other things. It's like, we agreed. Maybe she'd eat an egg or something. It's like, or, or, or I think it was eggs. And, and I think, I don't remember what it was. There was a few other things. I said, okay, look, here's what you do. Get up in the morning and like have two eggs. You don't have to enjoy them. You know, because people say, well, I'm not hungry. It's like, what, what, why is that relevant? That's not the issue here. It isn't like gourmet time. It's not starving to death time. So eat your two eggs and maybe in three months you'll enjoy it. You know, until then it'll be like chewing down rubbery cardboard. But it's not that big a deal. So, you know, we upped her caloric intake by a factor of about four. And she came back and it was like, I think she came back two more times. It's like, oh, I have lots of energy now. It's like, oh, good. You're not dying of starvation. It's like, and I'm telling you, like, if you're a volatile person, if you're a volatile person, try this. Eat a high-protein, high-fat meal in the morning. No sugar. And a big one. Like, have a steak. Have something solid. And, and don't, it doesn't matter if you like it. Who cares? Cook it the night before if, 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 if you don't want to cook it then. Just try it for a week. And see what happens. My suspicions, I've had half my clients, I would say, have dropped their volatility levels 50% by eating a high fat, high protein breakfast. And then also notice that if you are crabby, you know, and volatile and touchy and you can't get along with anyone, um, go eat something. Like have two teaspoons of peanut butter and wait 10 minutes and see if you're still a witch. <laughs> So, it, so for some people, and, and, and if you are a volatile person, like your, your, your blood sugar levels tend to move up and down more because you stress yourself out more. For some people, that really matters. And so, look, try it for a week. It's nothing, right? And you might think, oh, God. What, what you'll find, if it works, is A, you don't get nearly as upset about the things that used to upset you. So, and that'll be a shock. You'll think, oh, my God, I would have flown off the handle because of that before, and now it's hardly bothering me. So that's a lovely thing. And, and then the second thing is, if something bothers you, you'll recover way faster. And so that's a good start. And so try that. That's, that's no harm. It's not going to hurt you. Um, try getting up at the same time every day. That's really important. If your sleep-wake cycle is not regular, and you're a volatile person, say biochemically, genetically, having a sleep-wake cycle that's dysregulated is going to be very hard on you. So it doesn't matter quite as much when you go to bed, although it would be good to regularize that too, but at least pick a time. You can pick whatever time you want. Like I would recommend like 8 o'clock or 7.30 because that's what normal people do. And unless you have a really good reason not to be a normal person, you should start by trying to be a normal person if you're being an abnormal person. So try to get up at the same time and try that. You can combine that with eating and see. Like my suspicions are 50% improvement virtually immediately with that. And then if that doesn't work, well, then, then there are more serious things that, that you can consider being checked out by an MD and make, making sure you're okay. You might want to go talk to a therapist. I have this program online I mentioned. The other thing you could try is go online. I have this program called Future Authoring. You could do the past authoring program and bring yourself up to date, but Future Authoring is a program that helps you make a plan for your life. You know, it's, what do you want from your friends, your family, your career, your education? How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? Where would you like to be in three to five years? Um, how are you going to regulate temptation, drug and alcohol use, and that sort of thing? You know, Keep yourself out of trouble. And how are you going to stop yourself from deteriorating to where you could deteriorate if you weren't careful? Takes, you can do a credible job of the program in an hour and a half. You know, it's proved very useful for people. Maybe you're kind of aimless and you need a plan. That's another possibility. So, but don't live with it. You know, there's lots of things you can try. Sleep, that might be number one. Food, that's number two. Number three, talk to someone, a professional, if it's really out of hand. Because you, what do you want to do? You want to suffer terribly for the next 10 years? And plus, if you do have a lot of excess negative emotion, it's really hard on you psychophysiologically because you produce a lot of stress hormones and that makes you old. 
So it's dangerous physically as well. So, and it's hard on your brain. So if you can get it fixed, fix it. And if, if it has to be medication, then look, man, everybody's, you're going to be taking medication at some point in your damn life, you know, because you're going to get sick. And my observation of people has been that, A, everybody gets sick. And then what happens? Well, s s this is eliminating random luck. Some people get sick, and then they do everything they can to not be sick, including taking medication, doing whatever they have to, and some of them get better. And others just, they don't deal with it. And usually, they don't get better. So you swallow your pride and you think, oh yeah, I should be able to handle my problems myself. It's like, yeah, well, maybe you should. But maybe, you know, if you're really depressed and you don't take an SSRI, then one day you jump off a building and that's pretty much the end of you helping yourself. And so, you know, you can take the, the, the drug, hopefully it'll help you out. You can get your life back in order if you're fortunate. Then you can go off it, you can taper off it. They're relatively harmless. Weight gain's a problem. Some suppression of sexual function, that's a problem. You know, so they're not without risk, but neither is anything else. So those are, those are relatively straightforward things that you can do that have a high probability of working. Quote, it seems to me that the purpose of life is to find a mode of being that is so meaningful that the fact that life is suffering is no longer relevant. It seems to me that it's true. I mean, it isn't necessarily the case that you can do it. It's, it's hard to do. I mean, and that, of course, it's hard, I suppose, in proportion to the suffering that you're undergoing. And it isn't necessarily the case that you can always manage it, but... but but sometimes you can manage it, and, and it's good if you can. People need to search for meaning because they get corrupted by suffering if their life isn't meaningful. That's how it looks to me. Because you can't torture an animal forever without it lashing out. And so if your life is nothing, if there's nothing in it that speaks to you, there's still going to be suffering. You can't talk yourself out of that. And so then I see people tearing, tearing down traditional structures, let's say, or they're casual about them. Another rule in this new book is uh, do not casually denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. Well, why social institutions? Well, I've counseled lots of people who were lost. And so if you came to see me and I was your therapist, I'm very practical. I'd say to you, okay, well, let's look at your life for a minute. Um, do you have an intimate relationship? What about your family? And that could be, you know, married with kids, or it could be the family of your birth, your siblings and your parents and so on. How's that functioning? Do you have anyone there? Do you have a job or maybe a career even if you're fortunate, but at least a job that keeps body and soul together and maybe where there's some chance of advancement and hope. Um, do you know how to use your time outside of work productively? Uh, do you take care of your mental and physical health? Do you manage the temptations, drug and alcohol use and that sort of thing? Do you manage those temptations effectively? Um, are you educated as, are you as educated as you are intelligent? You know, have you, and those are standard, those are standard patterns of activity in the world. Do you have kids? Do you have a wife do you, or a husband? Do you have a job? I mean, it's mundane in some sense, but, and you can look beyond all those standard answers for meaning, but if you're overwhelmed by life, anxious and, and suffering, that's a good place to start. Put that together. Why? Well, the answer to that is because that's what people do. That's what people do. That's the best we've been able to manage. And so, and if you don't have that, because you're a human being like other human beings, you're going to suffer for it. And so attacks on that, assaults on that aren't that helpful. I see this sometimes with young people when they're talking about getting married. We don't need to get married. We don't need a piece of paper. It's like, really? That's your, 
That's the depth of thought you've put into this? It's like you're not going to mark this permanence with conscious awareness and uh, social celebration and the sanction of your community and a beautiful ceremony? That's just nothing? You're going to let that go? Well, what are you, what are you going to replace it with? Nothing. Huh. You know, you can say it's, it's, I don't want to be married in a church. I don't believe in God. Fair enough, but good luck filling in the hole. What would be success, a successful effect for this book? looking back 12 months from now, 24 months from now. Well, I would like, it would be lovely if it had the same effect on people as the last book appeared to have. You know, I'm, I mean, it's comforting to me to read through my YouTube comments, oddly enough, because that isn't generally a place people would go for comfort. You know, untold numbers of people have said to me in person, but publicly in, in that way, that they've put their lives together, at least in some ways. And you talked about Viktor Frankl. You know, when I wrote Maps of Meaning, I said, well, I was interested in malevolence. I was deeply affected by the accounts I'd read of what happened in the Second World War and in Germany and what happened in Soviet Union and in China. These horror shows that characterized the 20th century. Constrained malevolence. And so if you study malevolence, you start to understand what the opposite of that is. The opposite of malevolence is something like the hero's journey. You know, and it's it's easy to be cynical about that, but, well, it's not that easy because if you're cynical about that, then you undermine your own life. And everyone knows this. This is the other thing that's so interesting. Everyone knows this. You never teach someone you love to lie. You're always appalled if you have a son or daughter. You're always appalled if they don't tell the truth. You know in the deepest part of your heart that if you don't tell the truth, the world falls apart. And that's actually true. You know, I talked about unearned wisdom. It's, it's no trivial matter to understand that. You know, Dostoevsky said everyone is responsible for everything that happens to them and everything that happens to everyone else as well. And, you know, that's an insane statement. And he was a very extreme person, but it's also true. And I think that's part of what people get a glimpse of when they have a hallucinogenic induced religious experience. It's like this is a lot more resting on you than you think. And you know that. You don't wake up in the morning berating yourself for telling the truth. You wake up at four in the morning berating yourself for violating your conscience. You know, and classically, in, in, at least in some strains of Christian thinking, conscience is associated with Christ or with the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the voice of God within. And I'm aware of all the criticisms of ideas like that, but, you know, it's pretty... It's really something that you can't control your conscience. So what, what is it exactly? It's not you. You're responsible to it. It holds you accountable. It transcends you. So what is it? Well, if you think it's nothing, well, violate it for a while and see what happens. So, you know, I hope what I wrote in Beyond Order is true, you know, and if it's true, it should do some good, because what's true does good, at least that's the hope.
What advice do you have for a young man in his 20s? Make a plan. Look at what you're interested in. Get disciplined about something. Allow for the possibility that you have something important to contribute to the world and that the world would be a lesser place without that contribution. Don't be afraid of taking on responsibility. You're so... It's where you find what sustains you in your life. You can take on too much responsibility. You, you have to be cautious in that regard, but that's a less common problem than not taking on enough. A lot of the things that people regard as traps are actually the means to their life. You know, often young people are afraid of commitment, for example, in the context of a romantic relationship, and because they feel that that's going to interfere with their pursuit of something more valuable, but that's just not the case. It's, you're not going to find something more valuable in your life than a committed relationship with someone that you love that sustains itself across time and that in all likelihood produces children. That's life. And there may be people for whom avoiding that is the better route, but those people are very rare and you need a real reason to assume that you're one of those people. And hopefully for you, you're not. Um, you know, I've had a very good career, a very meaningful career in multiple dimensions, and it's still been the case for me that the most important part of my life has been my intimate relationship with my wife and my, and my family. So don't be afraid of that, or be afraid of it, but don't let that stop you from, from pursuing it.